Chapter 2 My parents were nowhere. I began to run across the field towards the peasants' huts. A rotted crucifix, once painted blue, stood at the crossroads. A holy picture hung at the top, from which a pair of barely visible but seemingly tear-stained eyes gazed at the empty fields and the red glow of the rising sun. A gray bird perched on an arm of the cross. On catching sight of me, it spread its wings and it vanished. The wind carried the charred smell of Marta's hut over the field. A narrow thread of smoke drifted from the coiling ruins towards the wintry sky. Chilled and terrified, I entered the village. The hut sunk halfway to the earth, with low-slung thatch roofs and boarded-up windows stood along both sides of the packed dirt road. The dogs tied to the fence noticed me and began to howl and strain against their chains. Afraid to move, I halted in the middle of the road, expecting one of them to break free at any moment. The monstrous idea that my parents were not here and would not be here passed through my mind. I sat down and began to cry again, calling for my father and mother and even Nanny. A crowd of men and women was gathered around me, talking in a dialect unknown to me. I feared that their suspicious looks and movements, <coughs> several were holding dog, which snarled and strained towards me. Someone jabbed me from behind with a rake. I jumped aside. Someone else pricked me with a sharp prong. Again I sprang away, crying loudly. The crowd became more lively. A stone struck me. I lay down, faced the earth, not wishing to know what might happen next. My head was being bombarded with dried cow dung, moldy potatoes, apple cores, handfuls of earth and small stones. I covered my face with my hands and screamed in the dust which covered the road. Someone yanked me from the ground, a tall red-headed peasant, held me by the hair and dragged me towards him, twisting my ear with the other hand. I resisted desperately. The crowd shrieked with laughter. The man pushed me, kicked me with his wood, wood-soled shoe. The mob roared. The men clasped their bellies, shaking with laughter, and the dogs struggled closer towards me. A peasant with a burlap sack pushed his way through the crowd. He grabbed me by the neck and slit the sack over my head. Then he threw me to the ground and tried to knead the rest of my body into this stinking black soil. I lashed out with my feet and hands. I bit and scratched, but a blow on the back of my head quickly made me lose consciousness. I awoke in pain, crammed in the sack. I was being carried on someone's shoulders, whose sweaty heat I felt through rough cloth. The sack was tied with string above my head. When I tried to free myself, the man put me down on the ground and knocked me breathless and groggy with several kicks. Afraid to move, I sat hunched as though in a stupor. We arrived at a farm. I smelled manure and heard the bleeding of goats and the mooing of a cow. The sack was dumped on the floor and the hut of someone whacked it with a whip. I leapt out of the sack, bursting through the tied up neck as if burned. The, pe the peasant stood there with a whip in his hand. He brought it down on my legs. I, hoped to, I hopped about like a squirrel while he continued whipping me. People entered the room. A woman in a stained, pulled up apron, small children who crawled out like cockroaches from their feather beds and from behind the oven and two farmhands. They surrounded me. One tried to touch my hair. When I turned towards him, he quickly withdrew his hand. They exchanged remarks about me. Although I could not understand much of what I heard, the word gypsy many times. I tried to tell them something, but my language and the manner in which I spoke, it only made them giggle. The peasants who had brought me began to whack my calves again. 
I jumped higher and higher while the children and adults howled with laughter. I was given a piece of bread and locked in the firewood closet. My body burnt from the slashes of the whip. I could not fall asleep. It was dark in the closet and I heard rats scampering near me. When they touched my legs I cried out, scaring the hen sleeping behind the wall. During the next few days, peasants with their families came to the hut to stare at me. The owner whipped my welt encrusted legs so I would hop like a frog. I was nearly naked, but for the sack I was given to wear, with the two holes cut in the bottom for my legs. The sack often fell off when I jumped up and down. The men would roar, and the women would titter, looking at me while I tried to cover my little tassel. I started a I stared, at, I stared at a few of them straight in the eye, and they would rapidly avert their eyes, or spit three times, and drop their gaze. One day an elderly woman called Olga, the wise one, came to the hut. The owner treated her with obvious respect. She looked me all over, scrutinized my eyes and teeth, felt my bones, and ordered me to urinate into a small jar. She examined the color of my urine. Then, for a long time, she contemplated the long scar on my belly, the souvenir of my appendectomy, and she kneaded my stomach with her hands. After the inspection, she haggled fiercely at length with the peasant, until finally she tied a string around my neck and led me away. I had been bought. I began to live with her in her hut. It was a two-room dugout, full of piles of dry grass, leaves, and shrubs, small oddly shaped colored stones, frogs, moles, and pots of wriggling lizards and worms. In the center of the hut burned a fire, over which cauldrons were suspended. Olga showed me everything. Henceforth, I had to take care of the fire, bring faggots from the forest, and clean the stalls of the animals. The hut was full of varied powders which Olga prepared in her large mortar, grinding up the mixing of the different components. I had to help her with this. Early in the morning she took me to visit the village huts. The women and men crossed themselves when they saw us, but otherwise greeted us politely. The stick waited inside. When we when we saw a moaning woman clutching her abdomen, Olga, Olga ordered me to massage the woman's warm, moist belly and to stare at it without pausing, while she muttered some words and made various signs in the air over our heads. One time we attended a child with a rotting leg, covered with wrinkled brown skin, from which the bloody yellow pus oozed. The stench from the leg was so strong that even Olga had to open the door every few moments to let the draft of fresh air. All day long I stared at this gangrenous leg while the child alternately sobbed and fell asleep. Its terrified family sat outside praying loudly. When the child's attention flagged, Olga applied to his leg a red-hot rod that was held ready in the fire, carefully burned out the entire wound. The child lashed out on all sides, screaming wildly, faded, and regained consciousness. A smell of charred flesh filled the room. The wound sizzled as though pieces of bacon were being seared in the skillet. After the wound was burned out, Olga covered it with gobs of wet, wet bread to which were kneaded mold and freshly gathered cobwebs. Olga had treatment for nearly every disease, and my admiration for her steadily grew. People came to her with an enormous range of complaints, and she could always help them. When a man's ears hurt, Olga washed them with caraway oil, inserted into each ear a piece of linen wound it into a trumpet shape and soaked in hot wax and set fire to the linen from the outside. The patient, tied to the table, shrieked with pain when the fire burned out the remainder of the cloth inside the ear. 
Then she promptly blew out the residue, sawdust as she called it, from, from the ear, and coated the burnt area with an ointment made from juice of a squeezed onion, a bile of a billy goat, a rabbit, and a dash of rod vodka. She could also cut out boils, tumors, and winds, and pull out decayed teeth. She kept the excised boils in vinegar until they became marinated and could be used as medicines. She carefully drained the pus that superated from the wounds into special cups and left the ferment for several days. As for the extracted teeth, I pulverized them myself into a, in a large mortar and the resulting powder was dried over pieces of bark on top of the oven. Sometimes in the dark of the night, a frightened peasant would rush in for Ogo, and off she would go to attend a childbirth, covering herself with large wrap and shuddering from the chill and lack of sleep. When she was asked to one of the neighboring villages and did not return for several days, I watched over the hut, feeding the animals keeping the fire burning. Although Olga spoke in a strange dialect, we came to understand each other quite well. In the winter, when a storm range of the village was in tight embrace of impassable snows, we would sit together in the warm hut and Olga would tell me of all of God's children and all of Satan's spirits. She called me the Black One. From her I learned for the first time that I was possessed by an evil spirit, which crouched in me like a mole in a deep burrow, and whose presence I was unaware. Such a person as I, possessed of evil spirit, could be recognized by his bewitched black eyes, which did not blink when they gazed at bright clear eyes. Hence, Ogle declared, I could stare at other people and unknowingly cast a spell over them. Bewitched eyes can not only cast a spell, but can only remove it, she explained. I must take care while staring at people or animals or even grain to keep my mind blank of anything other than disease I was helping her remove from them. For when bewitching eyes look at the healthy child, he will immediately begin to waste away. When at a calf, it will drop dead at a sudden disease. When at grass, the hay will rot after the harvest. The evil spirit which dwelt in me attracted its very nature other mysterious beings. Phantoms drifted around me. A phantom is silent, reticent, and rarely seen. Yet it is persistent. It trips people of fields and forests, peeks into huts, can turn itself into a vicious cat or rabid dog, and moans when enraged. At midnight it turned into hot tar. Ghosts are attracted to evil spirits. They are persons long dead, condemned to eternal damnation, returning to life only at a full moon, having superhuman powers which eyes always turned mournfully eastward. Vampires, perhaps, the most harmful of these intangible threats, because they often assume human forms, are also drawn to a possessed person. Vampires are people who were drowned without having been first baptized, or who were abandoned by their mothers. They grow up at an age of seven in water or in the forest, whereupon they take human form again changing into vagabonds. Instability try to gain access to Catholic or unite churches wherever they can. Once they have taken nest there, they stir restlessly around the altars, maliciously soil the pictures of the saints, bite, break, or destroy the holy objects, and when possible suck blood from a sleeping man. Olga suspected me of being a vampire, and now and then told me so. To restrain the desire of my evil spirit and prevent the metamorphosis into a 
ghost or phantom, she would every morning prepare a bitter elixir, which I had to drink while eating a chunk of garlicky charcoal. Other people also feared me. Whenever I attempted to walk through the village alone, people would turn their heads and make the sign of the cross. What is more, pregnant women would run away from me in panic. The bolder peasants unleashed dogs on me, and had I not learned to flee quickly and always keep close to Ogle's hut, I would have returned. Al I would not have returned alive from any of these excursions. I usually remain in the hut, preventing an albino cat from killing a caged head. Was black in great rarity and much valued by Olga. I also looked at the blank eyes of the toads, hopping on ta tall pots, kept the fire burning in the stove, stirred simmering brews and peeled rotten potatoes, gathering carefully a cup of greenish mold which Olga applied to wounds and, br and bruises. Olga was highly respected in the village, and when I accompanied her, I did not fear anyone. She was often asked to come and sprinkle the eyes of cattle to protect them from any malicious spell while they were being driven to market. She showed the peasants the manner in which they should spit three times in purchasing a pig, and how to feed a heifer with specially prepared bread containing a sanctified herb before mating with a bull. No one in the village would buy horse or cow until Olga had decreed that the animal would remain healthy. She would pour water over it, and after seeing how it shook itself, would give the verdict on which the price and often the very sale depended. Spring was coming. Ice was breaking up the river, and the low rays of the sun penetrated the slippery coils of the eddies of the rushing water. Blue dragonflies hovered above the currents, struggling with their sudden burst of cold, wet, wet wind. Wraiths of moisture rising from the sun-warmed surface of the lake were seized upon by the gust and eddies of the wind and the teased-out wisp of the wool, and drawn up in their turbulent air. Yet when the eagerly expected warmer weather came at last, it would brought along a plague. The people who had stuck wriggled with pain like transfixed earthworms, were shaken by ga ghastly chill, and died without regaining consciousness. I returned with Olga from hut to hut, st stared at the patients in order to drive the sickness out of them, but all to no avail. The disease proved too strong. Behind this, the tightly shut windows, inside the half-dark huts, the dying and suffering groans and cried out women pressed their small, tightly swaddled bodies of their babies, whose lights were swiftly ebbing against their breast. Man in despair covered their fever racked wives with feather mattresses and sheepskins. Children gazed tearfully at the blue spotted faces of their dead parents. The plague persisted. The villagers would come to thresholds of their huts, raise their eyes from the earthly dust, and search for God. He alone could assuage the bitter sorrow. He alone could bestow the mercy of serene sleep on these tormented human bodies. He alone could change the horrible enigmas of the disease into ageless health. He alone could deaden the pain of a mother mourning for her lost child. He alone. But God, in his impenetrable wisdom, waited. Fires burned around the huts, and the paths of the gardens of the yards were fumigated with smoke. The ringing strokes of axes and the cracks of the falling trees could be heard from the neighboring forest as the men hewed, a wooden needed, hewed the wood needed to keep the fires alive. I heard the crisp sound the crisp, sharp sounds of axe blades on trucks coursing through the clear, still air. As they reached the pastures and the villages, they became strangely muffled and fainted. 
as a fog hides and dims a candle flame, so the silent brooding air, heavy with disease, absorbed and enmeshed the sound of the poison net. One evening my face began to burn, and I shook with uncontrollable tremors. Olga looked at for a moment into my eyes and placed her cold hands on my brow. Then rapidly and wordlessly she dragged me towards a distant field. There she dug a deep pit, took off my clothes, and ordered me to jump in. While I stood at the bottom, trembling with fever and chill, Olga pushed the earth back in the pit around where I was buried to my neck. She then tramped the soil around me and beat it with a shovel until the surf was very smooth. After making sure there was no ant hills in the vicinity, she made three smoky fires of peat. Thus planted in the cold earth, my body cooled completely in a few moments, like a root of wilting weed. I lost all awareness. Like a banded head of cabbage, I became part of the great field. Olga did not forget me. Several times during the day she brought cool drinks which she poured into my mouth and which seemed to drain right through my body into the earth. The smoke from the fires which she stroked with fresh moss misted my eyes and stung my throat. Seen from the earth's surface when the wind occasionally cleared the smoke away, the world looked like a rough rag. The small plants growing round about loomed as tall as trees. The figure of Olga, approaching, cast a shadow like an unearthly giant's over the landscape. Having fed me at twilight for the last time, she threw fresh peat in the fire and went to her hut to sleep. I remained in the field alone, rooted in the earth, which seemed to draw me down deeper and deeper. The fires burned slowly and the sparks jumped like glowworms in the infinite blackness. I felt as though I were in a plant straining towards the sun, unable to strengthen its branches, restrained by the earth, or again I felt like my head was acquiring a life of its own, rolling faster and faster, picking up dizzying speeds until it finally stuck the disk of the sun when it graciously warmed it during the day. At times, feeling the wind on my brow, I went numb with horror. In my imagination, I saw armies of ants and cockroaches calling to one another and scurrying towards my head, to some places under top of my skull where they would build new nests. They would proliferate and eat my thoughts, one after another, until I would become as empty as a shell of a pumpkin from which all the fruit had been scraped out. Noises woke me. I opened my eyes and certain of my surroundings. I was fused with the earth, but thoughts stirred in my heavy head. The, word, the world was graying. The fires had gone out. On my lips I felt the cold of the steaming dew. Drops of it settled on my face and on my hair. The sound returned. A flock of ravens circled over my head. One of them landed nearby in a broad rustling wind. It approached my head slowly while the others began to alight. In terror, I watched the shrinking black feathered tails and darting eyes. They stalked around me, nearer and nearer, flicking their heads towards me, uncertain whether I was dead or alive. I did not wait for what would come next. I screamed. The startled ravens leapt back. Several rose a few feet in the air, but I touched ground again not far off. Then they glanced suspiciously at me and began their circuitous mark. I shouted once more, but this time they were not frightened, and with increasing boldness approached ever more closely. My heart thudded. I did not know what to do. I screamed again, but now the birds showed no fear. They were no, not two feet from me. The shapes loomed larger and larger in my eyes. The beaks grew more and more vicious. The curved, widespread claws of the feet resembled huge rakes. One of the ravens halted in front of me. 
inches from my nose. I yelled right in its face. The raven only gave a slight jerk and opened its beak. Before I could shout again, it peeked at my, it peeked at my head and several of my hairs appeared in its mouth. The bird struck again, tearing out another tuft of hair. I turned my head from side to side, loosened the earth around my neck, but my movements only made the birds more curious. They surrounded me and pecked at me whenever they could. I began to scream loudly, but my voice was too weak to rise above the earth, and only seeped back to the soil without reach reaching the hut where Ogle lay. The birds played with me freely. The more furiously I swiveled my head to and fro, the more excited and bold they became. Seemingly, seeming to avoid my face, they attacked the hair on my back of my head. My strength ebbed. To move my head each time seemed like shifting a huge sack of grain from one place to another. I was crazed and saw everything through a miasmal fog. I gave up. I was myself now a bird. I was trying to free my chilled wings from the earth, stretching my limbs. I joined the flock of ravens, borne abruptly on the gust of the fresh, reviving wind. I soared straight into the ray of sunshine, the lay taunt of the horizon like a drawn bow bowstring, and my joyous callings was mimicked by the winged companions. Olga found me in the midst of the swarming flock of ravens. I was ne nearly frozen, and my head was deeply lacerated by the birds. She quickly dug me out. After several days, my health returned. Ogle said that cold earth had been driven the sickness out of me. She said the disease was picked up by a throng of ghosts transformed into ravens, which tasted my blood to make sure that I was one of them. This is the only reason, she asserted, that they did not peck my eyes out. Weeks passed, the plague subsided, and fresh grass grew in the many new graves, grass that once had not touched because it surely contained poison from the plague victims. One fair morning, Olga was summoned to the river bank. The peasants were pulling the water, a huge catfish with long whiskers stiffly sprouting from its snout. It was a powerful looking, monstrous fish one of the largest ever seen in the region. While catching it, one of the fishermen had a vein cut in his net. While Olga was applying a tourniquet to his arm to stem the gushing blood, the others disemboweled the fish, and everyone's joy extracted the air bladder, which was undamaged. Suddenly, at the moment when I was completely relaxed and unsuspecting, a fat man raised me high in the air and shouted something to the others. The crowd applauded, and I was swiftly passed from hand to hand. Before I realized what they were doing, the large bladder was thrown into the water, and I was flung on top of it. The bladder sank a little. Someone shoved it with a foot, and I began to flow away from the river bank, feverishly hugging onto the buoyant balloon with my legs and hands, plunging now and again into the cold brownish river, screaming and begging for mercy but I was drifting farther and farther away. The people ran along the riverbank and waved their hands. Some hurdle rocks would splash to my side. One almost hit the bladder. The, cur the current was fast, carrying me into the middle of the river. Both banks seemed unreachable. The crowd disappeared behind a hill. A fresh breeze, which I had never felt on land, rippled over the water. I moved smoothly downstream. Several times the bladder sank almost completely under the waves but it bobbed up again, sailing on slowly, slowly, majestically. Then abruptly I was swept into a whirlpool. Round and round the bladder swirled, pulling away and returning to the same spot. I tried to swing it up and down to throw it out of the circuit by the movements of my body. It was ag I was agonized by the thought that I would have to spend all night in this manner. I knew that the bladder could not, if the bladder should burst, I would immediately drown. I could not swim. The sun was slowly setting. Every time the bladder turned, the sun shone straight into my eyes, 
and the dazzling reflection danced in the shimmering surface. It grew chilly, and the wind became more turbulent. The bladder, pushed by the new gust, glided out of the eddy. I was miles from Olga's vill village. The current carried me towards the shore, obscured by the deepening shadows. I began to discern the marshes, the tall swaying clumps of rushes, the hidden nest of sleeping ducks. The bladder moved slowly through the scattered tufts of grass. Waterflies hovered nervously on every side of me. The yellow chalices of lilies rustled and the frightened frog belched from a ditch. Suddenly a reed pierced the bladder. I stood on the spring, sprungy bottom. It was completely still. Vague voices, human or animal, could be heard of the altar groves of the dank swamps. My body was doubled up with cramps and covered with goose flesh. I listened intently, but the stillness was everywhere. 